And on reflection, welcome to our special feature on Hawkwind. Queen's Road Hawks album, which was uh, live, of course, Silver Machine, perhaps their best-known track of all time. Well, Rob Calvert came into the station early today, accompanied by Adrian Shaw, the uh, current bass player with the band, and uh, is in advance of a concert, which is coming up at the Palace on September the 16th. It's the start of their tour, it's Friday, September the 16th. I think it'll be a good show with uh, plenty of visuals on the stage. We had an extensive chat about history, about the changes in the band, about science fiction and the new album Quark, Strangeness and Charm. And on the inner sleeve of that album, there's an apology to everybody who follows Hawkwind for the turmoil and troubles they've had during the last year. So I asked Rob about that. Uh, well, I think it's an explanation of them, not an apology for them. But to explain it a bit further, we have had a number of personnel changes over the years we've been going as a band. And more recently, there have been even more changes. And I have an example of these changes sitting right next to me now, in the shape of Adrian Shaw, who um, plays the bass guitar and replaces Paul Rudolph. We lost one drummer. Um, there isn't really a lot of point any longer in having two drummers. We've experimented with having two drummers at various points throughout the career of the band. And in, the, in its earlier days, two drummers did 
add a, a, a volume dimension to the sound of the band on stage and a more aggressive rhythm drive. And it also looks very good to have two drummers. But uh, a band is a very fluid working situation. It goes through not just changes of personnel, but changes of slight changes of direction and presentation and so forth. It was found mm. that having two drum kits took up rather more room than was necessary, uh, left less room for the kind of stage antics that we're going for now. Obviously, personal and professional difficulties can arise and they quite often can become indistinguishable from each other. A personal friction, if you like, to use a sort of uh, industrial troubleshooter's term, you know. Works its way into the music. Yeah, it can work its way into the music and vice versa, you know. I mean, you, it, it is very hard to actually pinpoint what basically leads to friction, you know. It could be uh, a, a lack of uh, musical cooperation, it could be a lack of personal cooperation, which mm. cuts through to the end. But would you say it was yeah. a particular problem? Because you seem to have lost a lot of people, I mean, looking down yeah. the list, well, the Nick Turner's gone, uh, Lemmy, yeah. Paul Rudolph, The trouble was, I think, you see, Hawkwind has always been a very loose outfit. It began with no real identifiable shape, and it was a matter of uh, whoever was there on the night did the gig. A, a much more streamlined and professional organization has kind of emerged out of that situation. Changes are inevitable, changes are necessary. If you don't have changes, you have nothing. But is it... Changes is all. Are these changes changes in the direction of stability then? I mean, have you got yeah. a lineup now which yeah. is going to well, be... Well, we have a lineup now which is as long-lasting as, as, as is foreseeable. The music we're playing now, the stage show we're presenting, works extremely well with the people who are producing it. Well, I next asked Rob to talk about the personality clashes and personnel changes which took place in the early history of the band. Paul Rudolph joined the band. Uh, he joined on the understanding that he was going to be playing within the context of what Hawkwind had been doing beforehand. And the same with Alan Powell, who, who joined the band on, as a second drummer. But uh, Paul became very interested in the idea of changing the band's musical style to suit uh, his own taste, which was for a much more funky style of music. And there was a kind of, uh, almost like a, an attempted coup, actually, within the band, coming from the rhythm section at that time, which led to a lot of argument and, in the end, a complete d disruption and a sacking of two people who were uh, causing... Um, that disruption. Rudolph and Powell sounds like solicitors. <laughs> <laughs> Nick became disinterested with his role in the band, actually. He had been doing it for a very long time. And as a result, he became less cooperative. That also came to a head. And he, now he's doing an album with Steve Hillage down at Rockfield, which uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing. I think Nick is more, more interested in, in quieter and less direct confrontation with the troubled times we live in. And I couldn't think of a more appropriate person to produce Nick Turner's album than Steve Hillage. Yes, and Nick Turner there doing an album of Egyptian flute music produced by Steve Hillage, who will be coming up to Manchester later this month and uh, who we will no doubt be talking to. Here's, here's a track done by Nick Turner when Nick Turner was in the band. It's from the uh, Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Ti Do album. It's called Brainstorm. <laughs>
Hawkins' lyrics pass comment on science, usually in a nihilistic or a cynical sense. So I asked uh, Rob if he had trust in the integrity of scientists. I think scientists are very aware of the uh, future consequences of their research. It's more than politicians are, and more than military-minded officials are. I think you can trust them as moral men, you know. I but think they're very aware the whole time of what they're doing. I mean, if something is discovered, like cloning, for example, I think cloning is very much a possibility now for human beings. I mean, they can, it's foreseeable that human beings could be cloned, that is, reproduced by non-natural means. So that or you from could, single cells of the from body. From single cells of the body. So you could reproduce scientists and generals and so forth exactly uh, as they are. So you could have a whole gang of field marshals uh, who are brilliant and all based on the same man. But this is a frightening concept, and I think the scientists who have led up to this possibility are very aware of the... Uh, consequences of this research would be very reluctant to allow that the development of this to fall into the wrong sort of hands. I think to be a scientist of that kind you've got to be an extremely dedicated man, you know, because there isn't really that much financial reward or power even. I mean, most of the people, I mean, a Nobel Prize when it's awarded to a physicist really goes unnoticed by the public. But science isn't a power, money, motivated discipline. I think scientists, uh, although they have caused a hell of a lot of problems we find ourselves in, I think they're going to find the way out of it for us. So the lyrics then, perhaps... The lyrics, uh, lyrics may seem cynical in some way. I mean, I'm being cynical about the way these things could be uh, used. In so the it's, a, it's a, dis a disbelief in the political structure of people at large, really. of nuclear physics in the name of the album uh, uses descriptions of, of subatomic particles. Yeah. Uh, is there an understanding of science? I get a lot of my scientific notions, probably quite uh, misled anyway, from science fiction writers like Ballard and from uh, books that I feel I ought to read on certain subjects. It's such a, a, a specialised... I mean, modern physics is so specialised, I couldn't begin to, to claim any real expert understanding of even what quarks, strangeness and charm actually is. Now I have a layman's understanding of it and I read about this particular thing in uh, a book by Arthur Kirsten which is written as a general description of, of modern physics, not, you know, as a specialist in this textbook. Here's something from the live space ritual album, it's called I Like Upside Down. Yeah. 
friction <laughs> on the science fiction front, there has been some tie-in with the uh, quite well-established science fantasy writer, perhaps would be a better description, Michael Moorcock. So I asked about that association. The association we've had with him has been that he did contribute in a small way to the space ritual in 74. Yeah. I noticed that he was put down as co-writing some of the songs. He did co yeah. He did co-write a couple of songs, actually, but it, his contribution in terms of actual content hasn't been that great. As an inspiration, as a man, he's been uh, quite influential, I think. I think he's one of the major personalities of our time, actually, even if he may not... I mean, it's, it's yet to be seen whether he's one of the major writers or not. If you are making love, it is imperative to bring all bodies to orgasm simultaneously. Do not waste time blocking your ears. Do not waste time seeking a soundproof shelter. Try to get as far away from the sonic source as possible. Do not panic. Use your wheels, it is what they are for. Small babies may be placed inside the special cocoons and should be left, if possible, in shelters. Do not attempt to use your own limbs. If no wheels are available, metal, not organic limbs, should be employed whenever possible. Remember, in the case of sonic attack, survival means every man for himself. Statistically, more people survive if they think only of themselves. Do not attempt to rescue friends, relatives, loved ones. You have only a few seconds to escape. Use those seconds sensibly or you will inevitably die. Do not panic. Think only of yourself. Think only of yourself. These are the first signs of sonic attack. You will notice small objects such as ornaments oscillating. You will notice vibrations in your diaphragm. You will hear a distant hissing in your ears. You will feel dizzy. You will feel the need to vomit. There will be bleeding from orifices. There will be an ache in the pelvic region. You may be subject to fits of hysterical shouting or even laughter. These are all signs of imminent sonic destruction. Your only protection is flight. If you are less than 10 years old, remain in the shelters and use your cocoon. Remember, you can help no one else. No one else. You can help no one else. No one else. Do not panic. Do not panic. Do not panic. Do not panic. Think only of yourself. Think only of yourself. Yes, and that happy little cut from the Space Ritual album was called Sonic Attack, and it was written entirely by Michael Moorcock, all on his own. Clever lad. Thanks very much, Dave. We'll be back with your Hawkwind special after the break. Reflections Hawkwind special. Rob Carvert left the band uh, in 1973, only to rejoin a little later in 76, and the reason he left was to do some solo work. I was doing a kind of concrete poetry sort of thing at the time the band first started. I was trying to do other things with tape recorders and voices, Hawkeye was trying to produce electronic experimental music and it seemed like a logical thing to join the two together. Then the band very rapidly became pulled into shape by Silver Machine being a hit. That was the result of sort of getting together with Dave Brock and not trying to do anything different but we were actually trying, we were working on ideas for the Space Ritual. And one of the songs from the Space Ritual which happened to be Silver Machine which was appropriate to the theme of that uh, stage show. That made the band suddenly become more of an operational unit. But then after that, an idea I'd had for a long time to, to produce an album which was a play with songs came to being possible to do. I got a sort of, uh, I nearly said a grant actually, but an advance anyway, from the uh, record company, which was like getting an Arts Council grant, I thought at the time really, to do this project, which obviously wasn't commercial. And I found that so much work was involved in doing this, because it was, it was a, an album that involved an immense amount of people and uh, time, actually, because it was a very intricate thing of cutting dialogue scenes together with sound effects and songs, and it was my first album. So it took so much time, I found I couldn't go on gigs with the band. It came to a kind of like, either you did these gigs or you weren't in the band. So I left the band to do that. And then I did another album, which um, wasn't so much of a success to me, anyway, in terms of artistic success, anyway. That was Lucky Leaf. Lucky Leaf and Longshoots, yeah, that was kind of... 
I got myself into a contractual situation. It was sort of forced on me to finish an, another album. I wanted to do it much on the same lines. They wanted something more commercial. And then I got asked if I'd like to come back and do some more work with the band, which I thought seemed, funnily enough, it may seem now to say this, but it seemed to me to be more like freedom than the situation I seemed to be in then, which was one of having to produce uh, work which was not exactly to my... Uh, specifications. Yeah. That was also about the time that the band changed from a United Artists to, to Charisma. Charisma yeah. And was there a promise there from Charisma of better promotion? Well, there always is on a new signing. It seemed like something was happening anyway. It seemed like there was a new, it was a new start again. It was a new lease of life altogether. And Dave and I had been doing some work together just before that anyway. We were coming and I'd done some gigs with the band on my own. It seemed like, again, it seemed logical to join forces and, it's, and the result has been quite successful so far. We've heard something from the early period of Hawkins' music, uh, from the latest album. This is Damnation Alley, and in the next section of the interview, Rob Carver talks a little about the lyrics to the song. done two albums on Charisma, the latest release, Quark, Strangeness and Charm, and the first, which was Astounding Stories and Amazing Music. That was not so uh, hot, actually. That, that album was, was the result of too much internal friction and problems, and uh, th there were seven people in the band, and there were about four different directions the band wanted to go in at that time. It, sounds, it sounds, listening to that, it sounds like there's a lot of production and not a lot of music. Not a lot of content, yeah. yeah. A lot of production, not much content, really. Which is something that's been put right on yeah, Quark, so, yeah. and Charm. Yeah, there's a lot of content and not much production. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought the production was very good, yeah, actually. The production was bad. We did it ourselves, actually, without uh, relying on uh, uh, experts. 
We, yeah. uh, for some reason, this band has never been able to work with a producer successfully. I don't know whether it's the arrangement or the production, but especially on Damnation Alley, I thought that that came up particularly well. There's a lot of lot of things happening there. But it does sound more like mainstream rock rather than um, the underground music in inverted commas. It, that well, it maybe maybe it does, but it's still. Uh, I mean, a song which is about the you know the result of an atomic war on 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 you know in America is uh, not really the sort of things that most rock songs are about. There aren't many rock songs about that, about riding through a damnation alley to Boston with the serum to save the world. It's a kind of uh, science fiction comic book idea, but uh, quite subtly done, actually, I think. And there's a lot of musical content in that number, too, which is maybe not so new from other people's point. It is for us, actually. Mm. It's, uh, it, it has changes of key in it, and so forth. It's not just one riff that goes on. Yeah, you're not, frightened, you're not frightened of losing your hardcore support by um, changing this, because you, you, although you still stuck to the yeah. theme, the music does seem to well, be it's hard to, more it, commercial. It really is hard to know what, who, your, who your hardcore support are, and it's no good pandering to, to particular people. Your supporters are whoever is supporting you, actually. Well, I went to see you at Salford, actually, last year. You came up here and played Salford Student Union, yeah. and your supporters then seemed to be very different to the people who might support the music that you play. Now, I very much like the music on the latest album. I'm not too keen on the last one or the one yeah. before that. The people that, are, that surrounded me at your last concert, apart from nearly breaking my ribs, didn't seem the sort of people that would sit down and, and calmly listen on stereo to the music you're doing now. I think young people tend to go to concerts more than uh, people in the older age brackets. You know, I think uh, I think over the sort of age of you know going towards thirty, I think people are more inclined to not want to really go out on a rainy evening to see a band. I think it's people under twenty who want to do that, and that's why our audience remains young while we, uh, you know, crack on. <laughs> Yes, Robert Calvert feeling his age there, although, as he says, the audiences do stay young. And Rob is interested in developing his literary ability as well. He has a science fiction book in which the publishers are interested, and that's called The Eye of the Falcon. And he has a book of poetry in the proof stages, which will be published by Quasar Books sometime later this year. So, here's the title track of the album, which has just been released on Charisma, a song called Quark, Strangeness and Charm. <laughs> 